Hi, hello everyone. Welcome back. I want to uh, welcome you into the introduction of this uh, chapter of this lesson. Here we're going to discuss some of Kasparov's uh, pawn sacrifices. Uh, but during the preparation for this course, I've noticed that many of Kasparov's pawn sacrifices very much uh, are different from each other. So I've decided to divide this uh, this subject into two separate videos. So this video will be dealing with positional pawn sacrifices, which are more of long give you long term advantages. And the second video will deal with pawn sacrifices, will, which gives you more immediate, short term or dynamic advantages. I'll also discuss a bit about the differences between uh, each other. So here is our uh, first position from a game of Kasparov in the year 1977 against a Grandmaster Eurotaev. Uh, and Black just uh, played here the move b5. We see that this is a very typical uh, position for the Benoni defense. We see that White has the pawn majority in the center of the board. And Black has the pawn majority on the queen side. In his last move, Black actually sacrificed the pawn on the queen side, trying to get some activity because if you see, his position is rather cramped. This was perhaps not the best illustration of how Black needs to play in the Benoni defense. But Black was, once again, he didn't want to suffer and lose without resistance, so he played the move b5. Uh, so now the question to you, how do you proceed here with white? What kind of uh, great idea Kasparov had in mind here? I actually must stress that I'm almost certain that Kasparov uh, knew this motif or this kind of similar idea from other games that he had seen, perhaps of previous uh, world champions, which is something we also discuss in this course. So. Once again, I want to stress, in order to be a great player, one must study uh, previous champions and previous uh, games of previous uh, strong players in order to understand um, their concepts and, and their kind of way of playing the game. I, I'm sure this helped a lot Kasparov here to play his next move. So, obviously White, White wants to expand in the center. I'm going for one moment to... Um, not to discuss the option of just taking the pawn on b5, which is in itself not so bad, but this helps black to open up some lines on the queen side, and we want to focus on our plan in the center and on the king side, which is uh, evidently where white pieces are concentrated at. You see that all of his pieces are very much pointing towards the center of the board and the king side. So, how should white break through here? Because if he starts with the move f5, starting to advance the pawns, this would be a very bad positional move because black will probably play here the move b4, forcing the knight to go into a very passive square, let's say something like knight d1, and here thanks to the move f5, black is going to play plant his knight on e5, uh, and look at this knight, it's just a beautiful piece on e5, it cannot be chased away by any of white's pawns and it's going to be extremely difficult task for white to develop his attack when there is such a strong knight sitting on e5. So back to this position, Kasparov uh, had a brilliant idea here to sacrifice a pawn. He started with the move e5. First of all, as you can see, it's vacating a square uh, for the knight to go to e4, which is a much more a much much nicer square than d1 of course so if black plays the same move b4 white is more than happy to play the move knight e4 centralizing his knight if black takes the pawn and that's the main question because many people will assume that white is going to take back on e5 but actually Kasparov's idea this was not played in the game but his idea was to play f5 here only now the move f5 is coming and you might wonder what's the big difference. But now after sacrificing the pawn, white got two, even three very good things about his position. First of all, as we already mentioned, he got this nice square for his pieces, perhaps this knight. He has a very much absolute control over this square. 
Second thing that we can see that now the bishop has opened up is diagonal. Perhaps in a future attack it can be very much influential. And the third thing, which is also extremely important, is that we denied this square from the enemy pieces, from the bishop and the knight. Also, we kind of block, boxed in this bishop on g7. So here white enjoys a very strong attack and very good compensation uh, uh, for the pawn. In the game itself, actually, black uh, refused to take the pawn, which was perhaps not the greatest idea, he decided to take on a4 in order to open up some lines but now once this pawn on e5 was allowed to stay alive Kasparov start advanced, started advancing his pawns in the center after e6, knight b6, f5 we see that white is practically breaking through all of black's defenses his pawns are kind of um, blowing away all of uh, black's uh, defenses here so from this point onwards, it was without doubt uh, that White will win this game. So I'll uh, I'll leave it uh, like this. You can watch the rest of the game on the attached PGNs. Let's take a look at the next example. So here we have a game of Kaspar with the black pieces actually. To those of you who are very sharp in the openings and the pawn structure of different openings will notice that this is once again very typical structure for the king's indian defense we see that once again black has two very much mobile pawns in the center of the board which is uh, the biggest issue in this position uh, the question is how how can black take advantage of these uh, pawns so it is white to move and the grandmaster with the white pieces played here the move knight to g3 and this was a very provocative move because once again, many people will automatically play here the move f4, for example. Looks like a nice move. But actually this would be a bit premature, because white will take on h5. Black will, let's say, take back on h5. Please note that if black takes on e3, then white has this intermediate check on f6, after which um, black lost the pawn. Arguably, he still has a compensation here because his dark, dark square bishop will be very active, perhaps on h6. But this is, I believe, was not Kasparov's uh, intention. Uh, by the way, if, if black just takes back on h5 in this position, then after bishop f2, we see that white is actually the one who is having full control over the e4 square. He also has this long diagonal for his bishop to operate on. And our bishop on g7 is actually a very bad piece as long as our pawn stays on e5 and blocking him. So what Kasparov did, you might remember the idea from the previous video. It's something actually very much similar. e4. A brilliant pawn sacrifice once again. If this pawn is taken right away, uh, Black can now play many moves, but I particularly like the move f4 Actually sacrificing yet another pawn, but if this is taken it's um, It's going to be Horrible for white because now the queen gets into the danger zone of this rook something like knight takes d5 and it's very obvious that uh, white will not be uh, in a safe position in this game And if he takes on h5, we will actually reach just the same position in the game, so I'll just skip it. So he took on h5 right away, his opponent. Black took on h5. Pawn takes e4. Notice that white cannot really refuse the pawn sacrifice if he takes, if he, for example, uh, goes back to c2, then black will just uh, overrun his position. Uh, with his advanced pawns in the center, not a good idea. So, white took on e4, and once again, as in the previous game, what black played here? So the answer is, should be obvious by now, f4. Now, after black sacrificed the pawn, he actually forced the pawn to actually uh, block white's activity. We see that the the bishop and the knight both 
have been denied the square on e4. This bishop has been kind of being limited by his movements. Now this diagonal no longer is open. So white played bishop f2. And we see that now this bishop on g7 is actually extremely happy firing along this long diagonal. Now he is perhaps black's most active piece, evidently. So, but all of this, of course, come uh, with the price of one pawn. So for many people, it would be very, let's say, tricky to play with the pawn down because they would feel like they will have to prove something. But the truth here is that black has very much long-term advantages here, like we've mentioned. The long diagonal for the bishop, the control over the e5 square, the limitation of white's pieces is also very much relevant here. So it's not... Here we are going to see that black is not actually going to win the game right away or to checkmate the opponent, of course. He's just going to enjoy a very good positions, a very good position for his pieces uh, in this price of one pawn. The rest of this game is actually also extremely interactive, so I really advise all of you to um, to watch it uh, till the end. I would just to make a couple of more moves because I want to actually illustrate another very uh, very common idea that why is it like a spar of use here is black, and I think. Looking at this move, this is a very much move which is typical actually for his uh, biggest rival Anatoly Karpov Which just shows how Kasparov was very much knowledgeable in terms of knowing his previous uh, predecessors He played here the move bishop g4 Why is this such a uh, big deal because white can just chase away this bishop in one move with a move h3 which he did but now black retreated his bishop to d7 which he could do the same move in one go but here we see the square on g3 being a bit weakened and after a couple of moves actually uh, after white played long castling we see that the king is actually not very safe on the queen side this bishop is firing on this diagonal the rook will come to c8 at one point Black will have a very nice attack on the king side. Black played knight bishop e5 here. This is a really picturesque position. Just compare this bishop on e5 to this bishop on d3, which is completely limited by his own pawn, which actually black was the one to force him, the pawn, to be there. It's a very brilliant concept. So white played king b1, prophylactic move, queen f6, activating his queen. And after the move bishop e2, hitting the knight on h5, it was black who was actually very happy about the option of having the move knight g3. So you have a very comfortable square to go to with the knight. And after the bishop took the knight, we see that now this bishop on e5 is, is just a dominant piece. He has no rival now that the dark square bishop of the opponent disappeared. And from this point onwards, I believe Black's position is strategically winning, even though, of course, he needs to, he has a lot to prove in this position. So, I really much invite you to watch the rest of the game on the attached PGNs. And last but not least, we'll take a game from Gary Kaspar once again with the Black pieces against uh, Gary Kamsky, still an active player to this day representing uh, the United States. Once again, we have this typical King's Indian structure. White played here the move Bishop d3. And once again, the same typical problem for the King's Indian. Bishop on g7 is very much blocked by his own pawn. What Kasparov did here in order to liberate this Bishop, so I hope, the, I hope is by now should be more or less uh, clear. He played knight h5, very much similar to the previous game. Inviting Gerakamski to play g4, kind of asking the knight, where, where, where are you going? Obviously not back, 
because power played the brilliant move knight f4 here simply offering the pawn for Kamsky he could very much just take on f4 e takes f4 queen takes f4 but once again look at this beauty on g7 the bishop has become a monster there also we see that the square on e5 has been vacated for the black pieces perhaps the knight or the bishop can be very happy on this square and black has tremendous activity in, for, in return for one pawn but his activity is very much long term black has no lead in development at the moment he has no uh, immediate attack he just had uh, the more potential for his pieces the more free play so in the game actually Gerakamski actually in um, at first he refused the pawn sacrifice played bishop c2 but Kasparov simply kept improving his positions, his position, b5, knight e7, developing the knight, knight e2. We see that once again this knight on f4 is under attack, but Kasparov couldn't really care less. He, wa he do wanted to improve his last unactive, inactive piece, the bishop on c8. You might think exactly how he did it. He played a very appealing move, b4, tempo, and then a5. Now the bishop can be developed properly into this long diagonal. And here Kamsky could, could no longer resist the tension. He took on f4. He takes f4. We already see that this bishop got tremendous activity. Bishop takes f4 and knight e5. So not only the dark square bishop got a lot of activity, the, the knight got a very much central and the uh, influential square in the center black went on to win from this position rather um, convincingly so in this chapter we have seen a couple of uh, Kasparov's pawn sacrifices the main um, the main point usually in those examples were to increase the activity of your pieces those long-term uh, sacrifices denying some squares from your opponent like we have seen in the previous example in this one is more is was more about opening up a line for your piece the long the long diagonal it could be sometimes a file or a um, a rank this kind of pawn sacrifices were very much common in Kasparov's games and he used them and excelled them to win many many good games so hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, examples and i'll see you in the next videos bye bye